Hello and welcome back to the NUFC Opinion Blog. Today I am joined by Newcastle legend, former defender, John Anderson. John, how are you? I'm very well, Daniel. Thank you. Yeah, can't complain. Thank you very much for joining me. So I thought, I'd, I thought I'd start by asking about your early career. You started at West Brom and Preston in your early days. How were your times there? Um, enjoyable. I mean, I went to West Brom uh, at 15 um, as an apprentice, had two years as an apprentice, signed professional forms. Um, Johnny Giles was manager at the time and signed us. And then Ron Atkinson came in. Um, suffered really badly with homesickness um, and at the end of one summer I was uh, at the end of one season I was really homesick decided I was going to go home and stay home and Nobby Stiles was manager of Preston um, and he asked us to go and do pre-season training with them um, which I did uh, and settled in at Preston and that's how I ended up there um, the it went to a tribunal, the fee, uh, West uh, Preston paid £50,000 for us, um, which was settled by a tribunal, as I said, and then had three years at Preston. Now, you signed for Newcastle in 1982, I believe. And so what was your, what was your first impression of Newcastle when you first came to the North East? <sighs> well, every time I played at Newcastle for either West Brom or Preston um, played reserve games for West Brom at, at St James's, and every time we played, it was always wet, cold, snowing, <laughs> dark, gloomy. Um, so the impression wasn't great. <laughs> uh, for whatever reason, every time I, I played at St James's for for both Preston and West Brom, it was always always dark and gloomy. It was always during the winter, um, and. Uh, I suppose first impressions can be wrong, um, you know, because basically you didn't see anything but the the football ground, the stadium. You got there, you played uh, in the weather, but um, yeah, so first impressions were wrong, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. So anybody who says first impressions are always right, no, not no. all the time. Of course, then a couple of years later in 1983-84, you played in one of the most exciting Newcastle sides uh, that there's ever been alongside the likes of Peter Baisley, Chris Waddle, Kevin Keegan, Terry McDermott. How was it to play in a team like that that was scoring freely? Yeah, I mean, when Kevin first arrived, it was a little bit, it was a little bit scary, I suppose, would be the right words. Everybody was in awe of Kevin because of what, what he'd achieved, what he'd won in the game. Um, and we struggled a little bit, you know. Chris Waddle was, was still only a young man. Um, we had Kenny Wharton in the side. Um, uh, Kevin Carr was in goal. Um, John Truick was here at the time. Mick Martin was here in in that side, and it was Ray, Ray Verratti was up front. You know, so it was it was a little bit um, it was a little bit over on really. But the second season, the, the promotion season eighty three eighty four, obviously Davy Mack had come in. Um, Peter had arrived, and it was brilliant. It was great. It was a, it was an unbelievable season. It was one of those seasons that you never wanted to end. You know, you just wanted to to keep playing games, um, keep getting out out in the pitch because the three of those boys, um, Chris Waddle, Peter Beardsley, Kevin, were were phenomenal. Um, Terry Mack, obviously, who played with Kevin at Liverpool, uh, was a great guy, great player. David McCreary, Glenn Roder had come in as well, so we had a we had a good side, you know, we had a good side and obviously getting promoted um, was the highlight of that. Uh, but there were some great games, the games against Manchester City here um, when we won five, five, one. Carlisle was another one, scored five, um, you know, so unbelievable season. It, it just seemed to fly over, you know. Um, and it, it's true what they say, when you're winning games, you just want to keep playing. You know, you just want games to come and you just want to keep playing games all the time. Um, it was, a, it's a little bit different, to, you know, like you watch the, the side playing now and we're really struggling and it's difficult. Um, confidence is low. Um, 
everybody just wants to try and have that extra touch where back then when you were winning games everything was just instinctive um, and it was a great season it was brilliant um, absolutely the highlight of the 10 years that I had at Newcastle of course you played alongside Paul Gascoigne a bit later on so who would you say was the most talented player you played alongside at Newcastle well I, I Fortunate enough, you know, to play alongside Kevin, Chris Waddle. I don't, I don't think Chris Waddle ever got the, uh, the plaud that he deserved. He was a great player, brilliant. Um, Peter obviously had two spells, and Peter was undoubtedly a great player. But the most, without a shadow of a doubt, the, the naturally most gifted player was, was Gaza. And you've seen it from a young age when he used to come in, uh, in school holidays and that he was this chubby little kid and. Uh, we'd finish training and watch these kids who were on trial and he, he stood head and shoulders and from from a young age you could tell he was going to be a mm. fabulous player um, and he was he was at home when he was on the put, uh, football pitch or on the training pitch that's where he just loved being uh, but without a shadow of a doubt he was the most naturally gifted player I've ever seen. Now you received a testimonial in 1992 after 10 years at Newcastle so how would you summarise and sum up your time here in your playing days? Um, some good, some indifferent, some bad. Um, it's It wouldn't be Newcastle United without that. Um, you know, people are talking about the way things are at this moment in time. We've, we spoke about the, the promotion season, which was brilliant. You know, as I said, the support um, was immense. You know, the support supporters were locked out that the stadium wasn't big enough at the time um then we got relegated and a little bit similar to now you know it was all about sack the board um mm -hmm. get them out protests um uh, and difficult difficult to play you know I, I feel i have to say i feel for players at this moment in time I think they're a little bit fortunate that there's no supporters in the stadiums because that mm -hmm. anger would be, you know, um, they would see all that. Um, so it's probably better off the way it is at this moment in time. So, so what's going on at the moment? A lot, a lot of younger supporters, and include yourself in this, Daniel. You know, they they, they think this is uh, this is a new thing. It's not, you know, this has been this has been seen oh, yeah. at Newcastle before. Uh, so oh, it, it's nothing new. Um, it's been it's been with the club for quite a while and then obviously we had the years when Kevin came back as manager and had those great years and should have won the, the Premier League um, champion, Champions League years um, then Sir Bobby you know but, but there was it was that that spell you know and everybody thought oh well the club was like this all the time which it wasn't mm -hmm. you know um, if you took those years out uh the club would probably be what we are now, you know, mm -hmm. similar to what yeah. we are now. A lot of infighting, um, supporters wanting directors and chairmen and owners out. Um, so this is nothing new. Of course, more recently, you've become known for your analysis and co-commentary on BBC Radio Newcastle alongside Nick Lowe's and now, and now Matthew Raisbeck. How did that all come about? Because, of course, you've been retired for quite a while at that point. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, I had to finish in uh, 1992. I, I picked up a, an ankle injury at the end of the 88 season in a testimonial at um, Whitley Bay um, and had operations on it, never recovered and was basically told that it wouldn't stand up to uh, the rigours of everyday training and professional football. So I had to call it, call it quits. And then the BBC asked me to do... Um, some commentaries so it, basically i was still playing when i did them you know because even though i was under contract i wasn't i wasn't playing games I, I couldn't play games so so that's how i got into it and then um had great years with ian dennis at the bbc lozy lozy we got on like a house on fire still keeping in contact with nick um we those European trips, you know, that I mentioned mm -hmm. yeah. uh, un under um, Kevin and, and, and Bobby and one thing and another were brilliant. Um, you know, great memories, unbelievable memories, um, like a lot of fans have as well. And then obviously, uh, Ray's and Matthew Ray's back is taken over from, from Mick. Um, 
it's a little bit surreal at the moment uh, with no supporters in the grounds and you can only do you can only go to games the home games mm -hmm. you can't travel to to away games so you're doing them off screen which is um, not ideal because um, you don't see the whole picture obviously but it's uh, it's the, the way it is at the moment it's surreal so, but that, that's basically how I got into it you know I was still playing uh, when I got into it and it's it's just carried on ever since and on the subject of uh, the current state of affairs just to sort of wrap things up, what would you say to supporters who are massively disgruntled at the moment about the current state of affairs at Newcastle? Of course, things aren't good on the pitch at the moment. There's no, no doubt no. in that. So what, no, what would you say no, to the, the quality bit? of football is not great. You know, it's um, it's a hard watch. It's not good on the eyes. Um, and I suppose, you know, I, I've spoke to supporters who said, oh, it's the worst side ever. It's the worst football ever. And I can go back to, you know... <laughs> Um, late 80s, early 90s and the football wasn't great then either but we, we weren't a great side uh, the, the football that we played wasn't great so from a younger supporter's perspective I see exactly where they're coming from but I think a lot of older supporters will, will look back, you know, and even the, the late 70s, you know, when um, mm -hmm. things weren't great, um, you know weren't scoring a lot of goals, football wasn't great, crowds were way down Um but it isn't great at the moment. Um, and as I say, it's, it's probably better that supporters aren't there. Um, Steve Bruce is going through a really tough period. Um, I always felt that it was always going to be tough for Steve Bruce from day one, you know, because there was quite a lot of supporters didn't want him in in the first place. I always thought he had a mountain, a huge mountain to climb. He needed to, needed to, to hit the ground running, so to speak. He needs to get up and get at it and get results and the quality of football. Um, and it wasn't there. Um, and to be on the run that we're on at this moment in time puts huge amounts of pressure on him as well. Um, and you think the way things are going, you just wonder where the next win's coming from. You know, it's a big opportunity against Leeds the other night. You know, even though the second half performance was better, I still think Leeds were there for the taking. Mm -hmm. You know, I think Leeds all give you loads of opportunities. We didn't take them. Um, and that's a major problem. We're not scoring goals. We don't look like scoring goals. We're not keeping, keeping clean sheets at the other end. So it, it's, it, do, it doesn't bode well. But they've got to get a win from somewhere. Where that win's going to come from, I do not know. Um, how we get out of the predicament that we're in, I don't know. How... how how long do you give the manager? Mm -hmm. You know, he's um, he's been given quite a bit of time. Um, how many how many more defeats do you give him? He needs to get a win and he needs to get a win quickly and then he needs to build on that. Do you see any short-term solutions to getting that win? Do you think there's any different styles of formation we could play or any people that are um, potentially doing their best? Yeah, I, look, I, I, think, I think he's been chopping and changing. I think... He needs to to pick a, a formation um, and a way that we're going to play. Now, whether that's three at the back, four at the back, whatever, and just stick with it and ride with it and say, this is this is the way we're going to do it um, and work on it day in, day out till you get it right. You know, I don't think you can keep chopping and changing systems. I don't think it works. Um, he's got to find a system that players are happy with that he's happy with and just take it and play through it. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's all. That wraps things up, John. Thank you very much for uh, speaking to me. Uh, once again, as I say, thank you very much. So, yeah, oh, thank well. you all, and, and thank you all for watching at home. And how are the lads?